This tutorial is a project of nonprofitaccountingbasics.org, a free resource developed by the Greater Washington Society of CPAs Educational Foundation. Our goal is to encourage accuracy and accountability to help smaller nonprofits successfully manage and sustain their organizations. Hi, I'm Ben Takis, founding attorney of Tax Exempt Solutions, and in this webinar, we're going to talk about the basics of the unrelated business income tax also called UBIT. So what is UBIT? If you are a 501c3 or another type of tax exempt organization, you generally do not pay tax on your net profits. For-profit businesses that are taxable, of course, do pay taxes. But part of the features of being a tax exempt organization is that you're exempt from that tax. However, about 60 or 70 years ago, there was a concern that Nonprofits were abusing their tax exempt status, getting into all kinds of different businesses that had nothing to do with their mission as a nonprofit, and as a result, putting for profit businesses at an unfair disadvantage. So, in 1950, Congress amended the tax code to put in this tax on certain unrelated business activities of nonprofits, and that's where UBIT comes from. So, what does UBIT apply to? This slide states the basic rule. This is paraphrased from Section 512A of the Internal Revenue Code. And UBIT applies to the gross income derived from any unrelated trade or business regularly carried on by the organization minus the deductions directly connected to such trade or business. What does this mean? When you break this down, it is a three-part test. So to trigger UBIT, an activity must be unrelated a trade or business, and regularly carried on. If any one of these three elements doesn't apply, then there's generally no UBIT. I should mention that this is just the basic UBIT test. There are a whole lot of special rules and modifications that we'll look at in another webinar, but it's important to apply this basic three-part test to every activity that generates revenue to see if UBIT might apply. So let's look at each of these three different elements starting with the concept of what is a related or an unrelated activity. A related activity has a substantial causal relationship to the achievement of the organization's exempt purpose. That is the mission for which the organization got its tax exempt status. If you're a 501c3, that might be a charitable, educational, scientific, or religious purpose. And it depends on what type of tax exempt organization you are. But when you're looking at whether an activity is related, the activity itself must directly further that tax exempt purpose. The tricky part about this test is that you have to put aside the fact that the activity generates money that will then be spent on the, on the tax exempt purpose. You're looking really just at the activity itself. So let's look at a couple examples to see how this test operates. Consider first example. An organization formed to provide after-school music classes for inner-city children decides to run a charity car wash to raise money. 100% of the money goes to purchasing sheet music and instruments for the classes. Now you might think because the activity raises money and 100% of the money goes for activities that are clearly within the organization's purpose, you might think this is related, but in fact this would be an unrelated activity. Because if you look at the nature of a car wash by itself, that does not directly contribute to musical education. A car wash does not educate kids. So this is clearly an unrelated activity. It's important to note, even if the activity is unrelated, it still may not trigger UBIT. We've got to go through all three parts of the test. But as far as whether this is related or not, it is clearly unrelated. Let's look at another example. Second example. An organization formed to help find employment opportunities for mentally and physically disabled people decides to start manufacturing flower baskets in-house to sell to local stores. The organization hires disabled people directly to perform the work with some supervision by the organization's employees and the business brings in a small percentage of the organization's overall revenue. This example is different. They are raising some money, but the activity itself is what furthers the organization's purpose. The organization is formed to put disabled people to work and they've started a business that does that directly. 
So this would be a related activity. The next element of the three-part test is that the activity also has to be a trade or business. Even if you have an unrelated activity, it will not trigger UBIT unless it is also a trade or business. A trade or business requires two things. Number one, a profit motive. And number two, there has to be extensive business activities over a substantial period of time. Let's look first at profit motive. Profit motive simply means entering into an activity with the dominant hope and intent of realizing a profit. This just means that you engage in the activity in order to make money. So there's gonna be evidence of this if you've done any kind of marketing, changed your strategic plan, or adjusted anything in order to increase the revenue brought in from the activity. Also, if the activity year after year has generated more money than it's lost, the IRS is gonna consider that very strong evidence of a profit motive, and they're gonna assume that you did that on purpose. So if you're making money from the activity, there's gonna be profit motive. Conversely, if the activity is losing money year after year, then that's probably good evidence that you're doing it for a reason other than making money. The next element of whether something is a trade or business is that the activities have to be sufficiently extensive to constitute a trade or business. So in other words, there are certain passive income activities that do not require the kind of day-to-day -day activity and involvement that is characteristic of a trade or business. Think of certain investment activities. You may invest in a mutual fund uh, or an index fund and make money from that but you're not engaged in running those businesses, and that's not considered a trade or business in itself. Additionally, certain fundraising activities, you may call people, solicit contributions, you may have a donate button on your website. None of these things require the kind of active involvement of a trade or business, so they generally do not trigger UBIT. Certain kind of cash rebates also do not trigger UBIT for this reason. For example, I represented a large national organization that had a contract with its phone service provider. And the phone service provider went to the organization and said, if your local chapters will, will sign up for service with our company, we'll give you a cash rebate at the end of the year. And in this case, my client was not actively involved in marketing the phone service. They did not do any administrative paperwork in signing up the local chapters, but they did get quite a significant sum of money just based on uh, giving the phone company access to do a little marketing itself. And in this case, we concluded that the national organization was not sufficiently actively involved for this to be a business. So that's an example of how something will generate money but will not constitute a trade or business. The last element of the three-part basic UBIT test is that the activity must be regularly carried on. In other words, to trigger UBIT, an activity must manifest a frequency and continuity similar to comparable commercial activities of taxable companies. In other words, look at the business the organization is engaged in and compare that to the way comparable for-profit businesses operate. Let's look again at the car wash example. If you're running a car wash once a year or two couple times a year, that doesn't really compare to a for-profit car wash, which is open five to seven days a week, all year round. In that context, the car wash would not be considered regularly carried on. Note that if you're engaged in a seasonal activity, the analysis is a little bit different. If your organization is selling Christmas trees only in November and December, you're not gonna escape UBIT necessarily uh, just because you're only selling a couple months a year. Everybody is selling Christmas trees only during that time. So you have to do a apt comparison when you're looking at the continuity and the frequency. I'll close with a discussion about annual events because that is something or nonprofit organizations engage a lot in. Annual events ger generally do not trigger UBIT because they are not considered regularly carried on. If you're having one fundraising event or a conference or an entertainment event once a year, Usually that is not frequent uh, or continuous enough to, be, to trigger UBIT. However, you have to be careful of preparatory time. If you're spending six or more months leading up to the event using significant staff time, 
that can tip the balance and can potentially trigger UBIT. There are some IRS rulings where they held one organization that held concert series on two weekends per year with a very large six month telemarketing campaign leading up to it. That was enough to trigger UBIT in that instance. But another organization that did only three months of solicitation, that was held to not trigger UBIT. So this is very dependent on the context and the circumstances, but in general, annual events do not trigger UBIT on these grounds. You also want to think about whether the annual event is geared towards something that furthers your exempt purpose. For instance, if there are a lot of educational activities that are part of your annual conference, that may be another reason to escape UBIT. So that is the three-part basic UBIT test. An activity must be unrelated, a trade or business, and regularly carried on. And in another webinar, we'll look at some of the special rules that modify the basic test.